Welcome to Stand Up Comedy Sex Ed. It's where you can get questions answered like How long does it take the average man to orgasm? And How long does it take the average woman to orgasm? And also Why is it so hot in here? Audiences agree, it's brilliantly funny. Raylene makes sex ed fun. This show is entertaining, factual, and relatable. There's nothing worse than being halfway done with sex and feeling your vagina shut down on you. <laughs> You've got to see stand-up comedy sex ed. I am ready to go do that comedy show. <laughs> hey everybody, welcome to season two of the Stand Up Comedy Sex Ed podcast hosted by Raylene Taskowski and some other guests. And today's guest is psychotherapist Joe Court, PhD, LMSW, who is the clinical director and founder of the Center for Relationship and Sexual Health in Royal Oak, Michigan, and the co-director of Modern Sex Therapy Institutes. He's a board-certified clinical sexologist and author of four books, a lecturer, a facilitator of therapeutic workshops, and he's been practicing for over 36 years, and he's taking time to stop by our podcast to talk about sex, and that's really exciting to me. So welcome to to the show. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so my podcast is just, I like to talk about sex, all kinds of sex. Um, I was raised very um, vanilla. I still, I took a test the other day, how, how uh, sexy are you? And I still came out vanilla, <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. Um, but I'm just curious about a lot of things. And one of your friends said that you talk about sex addiction and basically you debunk sex addiction. A hundred percent. I don't believe in it at all. And science doesn't support it either. All right. Well, let's talk about that. Cause the, I mean, I think the only person I've heard of with sex addiction was what David Duchovny. And, and even then oh, I was yeah. just like, you know, you just can't keep your dick in your pants. What the fuck? <laughs> well, 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 that's one theory. <laughs> the other theory is, is the idea that sex can't be an addiction. There's nothing addictive. You can't be addicted to your own chemistry. Some people say you're addicted to dopamine. No, no, no. You can't be addicted to porn. You don't use porn. It's not a drug. And then you go rob a bank so that you can buy more porn. It's not like that. It's a compulsive, <laughs> it's compul- right? It's so stupid. It's compulsion. Yes. And there are reasons why people are driven to doing these things, but it's not an addiction. I remember um, one of my comedian friends said, it's not an addiction unless you're willing to suck a dick to get it. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> well, I would say even then it's not an addiction. It, it's a, um, you're driven, <laughs> right. right? You're just driven. Right. You're well driven. Yeah. So I thought that was hilarious. Um, so how so did you get in? Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so when I take those tests that you took, I come out kinky because I am kinky. And the problem that I, the reason I got into sex addiction is I didn't want to be kinky. It was the 80s. We had the AIDS crisis and full. I mean, it was like just starting out. It was horrendous. And I was able to come out gay, but I was afraid to come out kinky. So I instead packaged it as a sex addiction, found therapists who said, you're not a sex addict, you're just kinky. Let's help you come out and and be okay with it. And I fired them until I found a therapist that said, nope, you're fucked up. You're a sex addict. You found the right therapist. I'm like, good, we're good to go. And I did that for 20 (laughs) years. (laughs) And then you came out and then you went back and said, nope, I'm just kinky. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just kinky in my 40s. I'm like, this is stupid. And here I am. That's funny. So I've interviewed a lot of... um, Well, not a lot of, but SBDM people on the show. I've done a couple of polyamorous. Yeah, you mean BDSM? Yeah, what I say? You said SBDM. It's the same initials, but (laughs) it's a little scrambled. (laughs) Yeah, a little scrambled. Um, And and I'm just I'm always curious about because the one thing in the world I do not want is to be spanked. I was spanked as a child. I did not get any pleasure from it. I don't like it now. I'm not into pain. <laughs> right. Then you shouldn't get spanked. But if you're into pain and you like a spanking, then that's what it's right. for. I'm interested in the theory of spanking. You know, it's like sometimes when we're in the mood, I'm like, you know, God, give me a whack. And, and you know, then my husband will give me this teeny tiny little and I'm like, ah, it's not it. That's, <laughs> never, mind. never mind. That's that's not what I meant. Also, if you would actually hit me, I'd probably be super pissed at you right now. So. <laughs> So it might have just been a fantasy at that point. We have all kinds of right. fantasies we don't want to make real. Exactly. And that's actually, I would love to talk about that. Do you have some insight on that? Because um, I'm a big fan of masturbating. And mm-hmm. I and I remember on the Big Bang Theory one day, um, Raj had said something, something about his life was like, and just watching increasingly shameful pornography. 
And, and I was like, yeah, I get where you're going because your regular fantasies stop working after a while and you just got to uh-huh. get naughtier and naughtier. And then you're like, I don't really want this, but it turns me on. <laughs> well, let me say something about that. There's, I'll say about both things, but the whole naughtier and naughtier, that's what sex addiction uses. It's like, oh my God, it escalates and eventually you're going to want to do you know illegal things and you're going to, you know. No, it, it changes over time. It evolves. It's like good wine, right? In college, you buy a $10 red or white. You're like, oh, this is great. Or you drink it out of a box. As an adult, you start to get more money and you meet more people and you meet more, better wines and your taste buds evolve. And so does our erotic buds evolve, you know? I, uh, one time in one of my comedy shows, I, or I do this in my parties, I talk about like the first time you kiss somebody, there's like, you're like, oh my God, it was my first kiss and it's it, it's a thing. And the very first time somebody touches your boob, you're like, somebody touched my boob, right? And then you get to a point like the kissing and the boob touching is nothing, right? Yeah, uh, you know, right. I've been married 25 years. If he touches my boobs, I'm like, really? That's, you better work harder than that, you know? <laughs> right, right. And, and so then, you know, the same thing happens with sex. We become, I guess, desensitized to, you know, and that's why it's so important if you've been with somebody for a really long time to keep exploring and keep trying new things. Otherwise, it just you're desensitized to it. Sure, you're still having an orgasm, but, you know, it's not as exciting as the first time you tried that. Right. The, the erotic needs novelty. That's what it, and it, it needs. And so that's what you were probably looking for in your brain when you thought you wanted to be spanked. It was like, well, maybe I just need some novelty here. But it wasn't that. In the fantasy, it might have been nice. And I don't know, I'm not saying this is true about you, but some people, they want to be disciplined, right? It can make, it can feel good to have somebody treat them like a dirty girl or a dirty boy or whatever. Um, and so that's some of the psychology behind it. And some people just like the feeling of it. And they remember it from childhood. Family Guy did the best episode. I will never forget this. Stewie, do you know Family Guy? Do you ever watch it? Uh, no, I know who, I, I haven't seen it, but I know the characters. So the talking baby gets spanked by his mother and he's and because he broke something and he's so angry and he's so humiliated. And then they don't show this. It's a cartoon, but he gets a boner. Right. And he's like, "Ooh, <laughs> I love this. Right. So he tries to get spanked the whole time. Right. And doing all these bad things to get his mother to do it. The idea here that the writers know, no, I think knew was sometimes that your first banking is erotic. You don't know it. You're a little kid, but you remember it because it meant something to you. Right. That's funny. Also a tad creepy, but yeah, funny. <laughs> I know, I know it's creepy, I know. <laughs> it reminded me of, again, with Big Bang Theory, when, uh, it, did you ever watch Big Bang Theory? I love that, yeah. Yeah, and so when when Amy gets spanked by Sheldon, that is by far the absolute funniest episode of all oh. of them. I am Oh, dying. because she likes it. Oh, yeah, yeah, she likes yes. it. And <laughs> she doesn't get it, but she's like, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I agree. am dying. That one yeah. in the episode where she gets a tiara. It's a, you know, she doesn't swear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a tiara. Of course I love it. It's a tiara. <laughs> it's so stupid, the little things that stick out in our head. So how did you wind up choosing sex therapy and uh, your degree as what you wanted? Is it because you thought you were addicted to sex? Yeah, I had been in therapy for being gay as a teenager at 14 years old. I told the therapist that was my beginning of my coming out. And then um, I, I, I was kinky back then. We didn't call it that. He just ta- helped me talk about all my fantasies. And I didn't like those. So I put them into that box. And I, I became a trauma therapist is what I did. I worked because I also was a sexual abuse survivor. So I put them all together, which they are all together for me. They're not always all together for everyone, but they were for me. And I healed my trauma as I helped my clients heal their trauma. And they still had their kinky fantasies or they still had their sexual fantasies, vanilla fantasies even. And I wasn't trained, we're not trained as mental health professionals, how to deal with sex. We don't talk about sex unless it's a horror movie or it's trauma or we're abuse. Everybody leans in and goes, oh my God. When you talk about sexual pleasure, therapists flee. You know, like they flee the land. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I could do to help you here, ma'am. <laughs> no. Oh. And I felt like that's not fair to the client. It wasn't fair to me. So I got additional training. I became certified as a sex therapist. In the There's an actual certification process you go through. And now I can help people um, get to their own sexual health unbiased from me. Right. I'm, bi- I'm a big fan of making sex okay. Uh, I mean, like my rule is if if you're into it and it's okay with you and your partner, Ain't nobody else's business what you're doing. 100%. And, and people want to make it your business. Right. And there's nothing wrong with, I had a friend and 
she would tell me that she would do what she would tell me the wild, crazy sex things she would do with her husband. And, and then the next day she would feel ashamed of it. And I was like, why, why are you ashamed? Yeah. Good. Good. If you were giving friend. and receiving pleasure, then there is nothing to be ashamed of. We're and that was, be... yeah, that was still years and years before I started doing the parties and really got any actual information about sex. I was just like, what? I don't understand. We're talk, um, talked out of pleasure in this culture. Don't eat so much. Don't drink so much. You're having too much fun. Calm down. So we're, we're pleasure police in this culture. So it would it makes sense that it would come out sexually too. Well, and the fact that we're like probably the second worst nation about dealing with sex. Horrible. Horrible. I think every my, other. Yeah. My TikTok videos, you should sometime go on my TikTok videos. The comments are brutal and bullying. People are so uncomfortable. And when you get uncomfortable or you feel disgusted, you want to make that person uncomfortable and make you disgusting. I feel this way. You did this. Screw you. I have, I've had that at a couple of the parties that I do. And every now and then I'll get someone who is just so uncomfortable that they will literally attack me the whole time. And, oh, yeah. and, and then I tell the, uh, you know, at one, one, after I started doing this a number of times, I pulled my hostess into the other room and I, I said, you're going to have to ask her to leave. And, and she's like, well, and I'm like, you're going to get zero sales because she's making every single person in this room uncomfortable. It's not me, it's her. And so one hostess did, she pulled her friend aside and said, look, you're obviously uncomfortable. You know, why don't you go out to the car and come back and drink after the party's over? You know, and you get those people and they're so uncomfortable that they will literally just attack you. Here's and I'm like, there's lineup. nothing wrong with you. For Christ's sake, I'm talking about lubrication. I'm not talking about butt sex yet. Well, you know? well, here's my line about this, what you just said. When it comes to sex, the most uncomfortable person controls the room. Right. That's how that works. And you knew that then. And it was important. You got too close to something about her and she was unwilling or un she had maybe never, um, you know, managed it or, or explored it. And so you were right to get rid of her. Yeah. Well, cause it was, nobody was learning from me at that point. Cause they were all just looking to her to see how she would respond to literally everything I said. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's just like, you know, I don't need to continue this party anymore because I know I'm not going to make any money because she is making everybody uncomfortable. Erotophobia is real. Erotophobia is a disgust response, a discomfort response, and people can't tolerate it. And so they want to make the room and you all uncomfortable. It's a real thing. Um, I'm writing this down. <laughs> yeah, I love that word. It's a good word. I love it when I learn new words. Erotophobia. Me too. That's crazy. Um, so I'm trying to think of, I, I wish you would send me a list of questions to ask you. Oh, I, I could, well, you already have something. I'll, let's talk about this. So the whole idea, our sexual fantasies, sometimes we don't want to enact them because like what you said about Raj, I want to have shameful, what did he say? Increasing, I'm watching increasingly shameful pornography. <laughs> okay. So our fantasies are, are many times they're illegal. They're politically incorrect. So the gay activist during the day wants to be spit on and called a faggot at night. The, the female uh, act, women's movement activist wants uh, to fight for women's rights during the day and she wants to be called a bitch at night. It doesn't mean it's anything about you. It's, it, what's made, the fact that it's wrong and that it goes against your values makes it hot. And then people feel ashamed of it. And so then, then people think, well, maybe I, don't, I, I might fantasize about that, but maybe doing it goes against how I feel about my own integrity. Right. I, I was just thinking, so like one time I was watching something on TV and I was like, that is wrong. That's disgusting. Who does that? I need to go masturbate right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. It is like, I know that's wrong, but damn it. <laughs> and that's the thing. That's what gets embedded in our fantasies. People don't understand. I did a TikTok video and it went viral. I didn't know it would. It was such a short thing. I just thought it was informational. I said, if you know your friend, if you know somebody and you know their friends, that tells you a lot about that person. If you know somebody and you know their sexual fantasies, you, it tells you a lot about that person. Our sexual fantasies are extensions of ourselves. They're not separate from ourselves. And so they, it, it comes from our childhoods. Things that happen to us get embedded in the sexual narrative. Hmm. I was uh, molested when I was a child. And I, so this this thing has happened. I think I've probably talked about this podcast on this podcast before. Is that I've had a lot of bad things happen to me, but none of them were that bad. Like they 
you know, and, and so like I had, you know, my ex-husband was a little handsy. It wasn't that bad. Wasn't great. You know, um, Mm -hmm. and I was molested as a child multiple times, but it wasn't ever that bad. You know, there was, I was never really exposed to anything. I was never penetrated. There was just a lot of rubbing. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, I have no idea which, I had orgasms. And so that's, that still makes me uncomfortable to realize that my first orgasm was being molested. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just have to wonder how fucked up does that make you? And that, and so this is kind of the joke that I tell is I didn't tattle on any of the first few people who molested me because I had an orgasm. But then um, my neighbor's stepdad or guy that her mom was dating or whatever took me and her and another friend out in a car and then masturbated onto the car like the you know the old cars that had the center seat could come down he pulled it down and he masturbated on the seat in front of us and I went home and I told my mom that one and I remember somebody saying to me well after therapy like during therapy, like, well, how come you didn't tell on the first couple of people, but you told on him? I'm like, didn't get an orgasm out of it. Like, yeah, right, right. And it was because a of the joke, shame, but probably. I'm like, yeah. huh, I wonder if that's why. Yeah, it probably is why, right? The other other ones were personal. This wasn't. It wasn't about you. You could clearly, you could distinguish this was about him. Right. But you to know, this people, day, I won't do an oral favor. And I think that might be why. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not right. putting can, that in my mouth. <laughs> it can definitely cause an aversion. Or some people get off on it and that, that becomes their first, their sexual debut, right? So now they only want to do those things and they have a lot of shame because it started from abuse, right? right. But I always, we, as a sex therapist, I help people normalize that. You don't have to do it if you don't want to, but if you want to, it's okay. When it happened to you the first time, it wasn't consensual. When you think about it now and do it, it's consensual. It's different. Right. I will say that, uh, you know, when I talk to people about when they had their first orgasm, um, you know, the people are often shocked to hear that mine was at four and that I remember it. And I was like, who would not, I mean, who would forget their first orgasm? doesn't matter what age it is. You have one and your whole body goes, Oh, I like that. (laughs) Right. I'm sure people get really uncomfortable hearing about you at four. Of course, children have feelings in their bodies and everything, but we don't talk about any of this stuff because it's taboo. Right. Well, and that's kind of this, I make a lot of things untaboo but then I like I've asked people when did you have your first orgasm and you know other other girls have had it earlier too not from being molested but like one of my friends said she was in second grade and she was shimmying up the the pole to the swing because she wanted or like the monkey bar she was shimmying Mm -hmm. up the monkey bar and she and she's like and I shimmied up that monkey bar every single day for the next year and it never happened (laughs) again (laughs) that's not an uncommon story at all right and I remember uh, House, when House was on the TV show, yeah. and the mom who brought the, the child in in the car seat and said that her daughter was having seizures in the car seat. And, mm. and House was like, no, she's masturbating. She's having orgasms. And the mom was like, ah! Was oh, like, wow. Uh, that's a very good, as House was on a few years ago, so that was pretty uh, progressive. Yeah. It was. It was pretty progressive at the time, but I thought it was hysterical because I'm like, of course, it's what she's doing. She's just sliding right. herself down and hitting the right. bumps. And, right. and uh, People, yeah. the Harry Potter broom, when the Harry po- Harry Potter had a broom. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a vibrating broom. And, uh, and I, you know, the reviews were like, my daughter loves this. She's always riding it. <laughs> Everybody's like, yeah, but is she sitting still? <laughs> <laughs> Now, I'll tell you something that is kind of funny that you, we could talk about in your show. You, you brought it up already, butt sex. Can we talk oh, about yeah. butt sex? <laughs> well, I have a whole episode on anal play, but yeah, we can talk about butt sex all you want. Well, I bet and, you haven't. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, and I have not had a gay man on my show before, so probably you're going to give us some insight that I don't already have. <laughs> well, let me tell you, first of all, I'm not that kind of gay man. I have never had butt sex. Either way, really? not into it. Doesn't It's not erotic really? to me. I'm not disgusted by it. I know. People look at that. I, I finally came out about that a few years ago because in the gay community, right, it's like, who's the top? Who's the bottom? When we're going to fuck? Fuck, fuck, fuck. And I'm like, I don't fuck. I have a lot of, then what do you do? Oh my God, you don't have sex? Are you kidding me? I have lots of sex. I just don't have butt sex. Do you know what I mean? So I have a whole Facebook group, actually. Um, we call, I call it, you're not a top, you're not a bottom. I was joking, but it stuck. I said, why don't we just call ourselves sides, right? You're not a top or a bottom, maybe we're sides. 
and that took off. It slowly has taken off, but it has made people feel less ashamed about being gay and not wanting or enjoying anal sex at all. Okay. So I don't have a lot to say about gay men having butt sex. I have a lot of uh, things to say about straight men who have butt sex. So I am um, in my therapy as a sexual abuse uh, trauma therapist, get a lot of men who have been sexually abused, sadly, by male perpetrators in their childhood. Okay, so now um, as adults, they reenact their trauma by finding men to reenact exactly what happened to them as child. In child, mm-hmm. does that make sense? So um, they come to me and they they'll go to a therapist first. They think they're gay because they're getting anally penetrated, and the therapist says you're probably bi at least. So read Joe Court's book. So they read my books and they're still not convinced because they can't get to the. They come to my office. They're clutching my books and they're like, Joe, if I'm gay, help me be gay. I don't feel like I can get there. I've read all. They've read my books sometimes better than any gay guys ever read my books. And I look at them and I say, as a sex therapist certified and a licensed master's in social work, I'm obliged to tell you that your anus doesn't have a sexual orientation. Yeah. It doesn't know whether it's gay, straight, or bi. It's an anus. And it enjoys pleasure. It discovered that during the trauma, sadly. But a lot of men enjoy prostate pleasure. And that's all this is. And it's hard for men to wrap around that, no pun intended. Oh, we've, we've covered that extensively on this show. The oh, only thing that oh, makes you gay is being gay. You know, you. you have a I prostate you gland. Yeah, the prostate gland is there to be stimulated and you don't have to be gay to enjoy it. <laughs> well, if you go to what, my most recent TikTok, you would think that you were, you were the crazy one because people are, I talked about that and people are going crazy on it. Yeah, so they have erotophobia, erotophobia, erotophobia. about their butts. Yeah. <laughs> and homophobia. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. We, yeah, no, we've definitely covered, I've covered that a million times that awesome. it's, That's awesome. that doesn't make you gay, but I have, I, I am blown away by the being gay and not having anal sex like that. Yeah. No, that's right. Right. New right. To me. Because right. So, you, and it's the same idea. The anus doesn't have a sexual orientation. But sex is not um, special to the gay male community. Uh, straight guys love having butt sex with their women, giving it to their women, and right. that's not gay, you know. Right. And 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 I I talk so in my show in my stand up comedy sex ed show, um, I talk about anal play and I talk about you know forty percent of people have tried anal play before. Twenty five percent is on the regular menu, um, and then I talk about anal beads and I talk about butt plugs. Uh-huh. And, and, and the guys just, you could blow their minds open when you mentioned that anal beads are actually designed to stimulate the prostate gland. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Right. So you yes, know, some women enjoy them, but they're designed to stimulate the prostate gland. These are for yes, you. hundred <laughs> percent. Now, you know, sadly, some straight men won't wipe very well because they think that's gay. That's how homophobic and how scary that is for people. Isn't it terrible? Yes, that is horrible. Please take care of your butthole. (laughs) It doesn't make you gay to wipe yourself. Get yourself a cotton L and go for it. (laughs) Well, it's just so sad that people reduce your orientation to your sexual act. And we know as sex therapists, we know that's not the case. They're not always alive. We have a sexual orientation to whom we're attracted. We have an erotic orientation. What gets us off? And hopefully those match up. But I've had lesbians who have had fantasies about uh straight men um raping them now that's they would never want that they never had it right. happen it's just a fantasy it doesn't make her less of a lesbian right i i feel like most maybe not most i feel like many women have have the taken fantasy being mm-hmm. taken um or the rape fantasy however you want to call it you know yeah i, I think like taken better taken is yeah it yeah. feels a little more romance novel and less you know, raped in the, in the woods. Yeah. yeah no, I agree. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> and I think women are taught that. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's biological. I haven't studied it, but I know a lot of women are what you say. And a lot of men have the same fantasies from the other side. And maybe we're conditioned that way. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like a lot of it comes from reading a uh, historical um, bodice ripping uh, romance novels. Yeah. Where, that could be. You know, it's it's at, like and and if you go back and you look even some of my favorite authors if you look back at their work twenty years ago and it was you know maybe a, a Harlequin romance then uh, there's a whole lot of edge of rape sort of shit going on in those books 
And, yeah. you know, we used to think like, oh my God, that's so sexy. And, and now it's like, can I kiss you? <laughs> I know, I know. It's really kind of sad because in those fantasies, it's play. Everyone's enjoying themselves. In reality, it's not. And people are right. blurring the lines, you know? Right. And I find that it, I find it frustrating. Like I'm, it's, it almost ruins the books for me now because as much as I think it's hot as fuck, I'm like, mm, bet a lot of people aren't happy right now. Like mm-hmm. it pulls me out of the, yeah. the, you know, you know, you got your Montana cowboy and he just grabs that woman and kisses her. Yeah. And yeah. at first she's like, no. And then she falls into it and you're like, yes, this is hot. And then you're right. like, but did he just kind of assault her? <laughs> like, I know. I know. It's gotten blurred. It's sad. <laughs> you know, I don't want to, uh, going back to the whole penetration thing, uh, you know, we have decided as a culture somewhere, somehow, and it's really strange to me. Uh, that that sex, when I say sex, I have to remind myself, people are thinking of intercourse, straight or gay, and right. bisexual. And like, no, 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 foreplay isn't foreplay. It's sex. If you have foreplay and you have an orgasm, you've just had sex. But people don't understand that. No, 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 we didn't get to the penetration. Well, that's sex too, but that's right. not the gold standard. I try to talk people out of that. I love that because one of the questions that you probably know I'm going to ask you, because actually, no, because I didn't put that one in there. Um, I'm going to add it though. I'm adding that as my, one of the questions I always ask thing. Um, ouch. I'm putting it in. So because you've never, because you don't have penetration with your partners, actually, this is probably going to lead me down a bad, a bad path. One of my questions is how old were you when you lost your virginity? Now, I know that virginity has now become a quote unquote social construct. And you also mentioned that you were assaulted. So yes. I probably don't want to ask that question. <laughs> Here's a better question. Here's what I would tell you, because this is what we ask. We don't ask that question anymore. Okay. When was your sexual debut? In other okay. words, it's not based on any certain act. What, when do you think? So I had these parents and they had a son and he was uh, 17 years old and he, they found him um, on some webcam site where he was getting paid to show off his feet and masturbate. And they were, they were crying. They were like, what are we going to do? This is so awful. And I'm like, they, they charge said, him rent. They said, well, <laughs> well, charge him rent. He's charge making him. money now. <laughs> but they were like, we wanted his first time to be special. And I said, who said? That's his first time. That doesn't mean anything. It might not be anything right. sexual for him. You know, it's not your sexual debut until you tell somebody what your what it was. Charge him rent. It's funny. <laughs> hey, I am a comedian. <laughs> I know. I'm going to use that line. Now I'm borrowing from you. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll credit you. <laughs> Yeah, so I always ask those nosy questions and then and that one I like I like that better. When how old were you when you had your sexual debut? Like because that will cut off the question of um one of the ladies that I had on recently, I asked the same question and she said that she had been uh raped at a certain age. So that's when she lost her virginity. And I was like, Well, damn, that's not a rabbit hole I wanted to go down. No, but I um, love this conversation because that's a good article for me to write, you know. Now, but some people, their sexual debut is during abuse. And I have had straight men and women, cisgender men and women, gay men and women, bisexuals say to me, I've enjoyed it. Even though it was wrong and I was 10 and they were 40, I got off on it. And don't right. take this away from me. And I've had right. to learn that. Well, and that's, I mean, that's how I feel. Like, I mean, I had my first orgasm at four. I didn't have sex until I was 12, 13, but still, that's pretty damn early. Yeah. Um and, and I would like to think that if I hadn't been molested at four and I wasn't obsessed with orgasms, then I, you know, might have waited longer. We'll never know. That's the problem, right? Yeah, we'll never know. We'll never know how someone who went from a complete prude became, you know, one of the top sex toy ladies in their company and then turned into a speaker. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Sex. And we'll <laughs> never know if it's all tied in or if that's just the journey that I was on. Right, right. Um, I remember, I gotta remember to rewrite that question because I don't have it written correctly. I love that though, your sexual debut. I like it too, so much better. Yeah, it's, it sounds so much classier. I am having that other, uh, uh, it was um, Lindsay, Lindsay Walden. She'll be on again in a couple of weeks to because we're gonna go back and cover that subject. Because yeah. I don't think I've covered a lot of me too type stuff yet. 
yeah, yeah. Because I kind of, it was called stand-up comedy sex ed. I want it to be fun and enlightening. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. And, and, and you probably couldn't do it. You could probably talk about something really heavy and be funny and enlightening, but people may have a bad reaction to it. I don't know. Yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, I'm still surprised people are listening to it. So. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> I'm always surprised. I'm like, oh my God, another hundred people listen today. What are these people doing with their lives? <laughs> well, you know, earlier, how many people? About a hundred a day. Yeah, that's so, awesome. So yeah, what you said earlier, not huge, but well, that's yeah. okay. I mean, it'll grow. You know, the thing about gay men, though, uh, if you've never had one on here, is the idea that we talk about sex in ways that straight people don't. We have it on our apps. I have on. Um, um, I took a picture of it. This guy, he's looking for Mr. Right, and this is how we try to find each other on the on apps and on dating sites. Um, I like to fuck. I like to suck. I like to be uh, have my be choked. I like my hair pulled. I want to be, you know, manhandled. I love long walks. I like the beaches. I want to go to movies and fine wines. Would you be my Mr. Right? Now, most women would read that from a straight guy and go, fuck off. That's too crass. Some women would get into it. Most wouldn't. But in the gay male community, we want to know what turns you on. Because if I fall in love with you and we're into erotic differences, this won't work. Wow. I never even really kind of thought of that. Yeah, and straight people could learn from that, I think. Everybody could learn from that. Lesbians might do it too. See, we have to explore our sexuality before we meet a partner where straight people don't. You just don't, you don't, you, everything works and everything's in your favor. And you, you know, even, if, even though you need more sex education, it's great you're doing this. Uh, we have to, we have to learn how to do this. Nobody's teaching us. So if you don't do penetration, what's on your profile? Okay, so that's what people say. So uh, without I getting like into what, some, yeah, well, also <laughs> see, that's what that's what people say. No, it's like so. Um, it's so what can be on somebody who's a sides thing is masturbation, oral sex, um, kink play, role play, um, sixty nine, um, everything else. I mean, you can go on and on. Fetishes, um, everything that you do that you enjoy, sexually, kissing the neck, you know, um, fraudism, you know, rubbing against one another, a million things. Toys, sex, bringing in sex toys, but not nice. necessarily for penetration. And I'm visualizing 69 is probably better with two guys. <laughs> I don't know. I've not had the other way around. <laughs> right. I I, me neither, because it's not my, oh. you know, not my thing. But, it, you know, in, in one case, you don't have to get buried. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's true. It's like two connecting male, female connections or something. I don't know. Exactly. So crazy. Um, anything else you need to tell me about the gay lifestyle that I can share with my people? Because I'm yes. curious. Yeah. Uh, uh, if I could say we don't call it lifestyle. I'll tell you who does call it lifestyle. Uh, the BDSM and swinger and polyamory. But in the gay, male, in the gay LGBT community, it, the only people that use that lifestyle term are anti-gay religious right wing people that say okay. we have a lifestyle, you know. Um, so anyways, uh, we're, we say community. And I'll tell you that I don't, I can't speak for the whole community. I can't speak for all gay men, but gay men are much more, we're, I can tell you this, the research shows that gay men have more sex than do straight men, than do straight women, than do lesbians, because we can, and, and hookups are easy. I can, I, within the next 15 minutes, I could find somebody right near my house and have a sexual act and come back and finish out my work day. And women and men don't do that. Many reasons, women feel like they're, they're going to get slut shamed. And women have to worry about violence. So they have to take precautions right. where men don't. Men don't have to do that. They some I mean it can happen, but it's less likely. Yeah. Well, yeah. I wouldn't I mean, I don't know if I would worry about well, I guess you still do have to worry about slut shaming, but I, I would be more concerned that I wouldn't get off. <laughs> mm, <laughs> right. Know? Okay. Yeah, I need a partner that's going to make sure that I get taken care of because if I don't want to just go have random sex. I, I'm in it for the orgasm. I'm always in it for the orgasm. Yes. Yeah. So, and most women have responsive sex, right? Where uh, right. It's when you start and most and many men have spontaneous sex. So yep. it's a little easier for them. I cover that also in my uh, in my comedy show. Like like and, and that's kind of the thing, because when we're talking about enthusiastic consent, for a woman, you're not going to get enthusiastic consent usually until she's already aroused and she's not yes. going to get aroused until you've started. Yes, that's right. And that's I right. find like some of this to be so stupid because I'm like, how many times have you been in, you know, with your partner, if you're in a, a straight, uh, had a, had a, anyway, straight couple and he reaches over and he's like, 
you know, touching, and you're like, uh, I don't really want to, you know. And they're like, okay, because you know, we're married, we're relationship, whatever. And right. then, oh, this is starting to feel good. And then 15 minutes later, you're face down on the pillow, sweating and you know, out of breath, and you're like, that was a really fucking good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and yeah. so the standards that they want to set us to are setting yeah. us up, setting women up for failure yeah, or men up for failure. Because if you're not allowed to touch me or even come near me until I've said yes, good luck getting me to say yes, I'm busy. You see that a lot less in gay and lesbian relationships. And the other thing you see less is fighting over porn. Most of the couples that come into my office are fighting over porn. It's really sad. And they think that porn's the problem. It is not. It is porn illiteracy that's the problem. It's the fact that people are, are uncomfortable with it and uncomfortable with their partner having an a auto-sexual life. You're having a sex life without me? I can't tolerate it. Everything has to come through me. And that's not reality. We have our own sex lives with ourselves and our brain, and we have a sex life with our partner. But we don't talk about all that. People don't have sexual health conversations. <laughs> I, have, um, uh, I have like a 48-hour reset before I can get another decent orgasm. Like I'm okay. not a multiple, it takes a while. And the longer I wait, the better they get, right? Mm. Cause it's kind of okay. like, you know, like a, a tank that needs to be filled back up again. <laughs> and, you know, my husband and I will go through spates of period where we do it a lot and then we don't do it a lot at all. And I remember one day, I don't know if I said it to him or if I texted it to him. And I was like, are we gonna have sex again soon? Or can I rub one off? You know, because I don't wanna rub one off this afternoon and then have you come home and be like, let's have sex tonight. And I was like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> I love that though. I teach my clients, you need to have, you need to plan for sex. People don't like to do that. They think, well, I shouldn't have to. Everybody has to. Even when you're having an affair, you're planning sex. You're saying, let's meet at this time in this place and do it here and where the, and you're planning it when you're in the beginning of a relationship. So I love that you have to do that. We all should. Yeah. Yeah, that was only once after that, he, you know, like I've just got, yeah, now we're back. We're, I mean, we're not on a schedule, but my goal for 2020 was, to, 2021 was to have more sex with my husband. So, so far, awesome. so good. Awesome. And people always say, how much sex is enough? It's the, well, it's up to the couple. And the models that we use are called good enough sex. In other words, you have sex. If it doesn't go well, okay, tonight wasn't a good night. Don't big deal it. You go to the next night, you go to the right. next time. It's casual. It can't always be mind blowing. If it was always mind blowing, then then mind blowing wouldn't be mind blowing anymore. Right, right, exactly. So anyway, all right. Now let me get to my nosy questions. Yeah. Uh, how old were you when you had your sexual debut? I was um, nineteen. I went to a gay bar and I met this guy, and um, it was very scary for me. So you don't know this about gay men, but we don't flirt. We cruise. And it's kind of gone away a little bit because we have the apps, but what cruising, flirting is, hey, how's it going? You kind of wear a nice cologne and you bat your eyes and you're kind of like, you know, you're, you're talking to each other in, in um, sensual ways. We don't do that. We um, stare you down. So from across the room and uh, if, wherever you go, I'm staring at you. I might grab my crotch. He might grab his crotch. And it's a whole play. And I didn't know this. I was 19 years old. I went to this gay bar and this guy starts staring at me. And I'm like, my mother was right. Detroit is scary. And I'm, this guy's going to murder me. It's a whole Jewish neurotic thing, right? So I was fucked up by the whole thing. And I left. So then I came back. I realized what was happening. And this guy did, it, did this whole thing. Anyways, so then we went back and we had everything but anal sex. And I enjoyed myself. And he was really hot to me. And it was a nice experience. Did you say cruising or crooning? Oh, sorry, cruising. Okay. I'm writing all this down. It's going in the yeah. show notes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good. Interested. Talk about it. And uh, when did you have your first orgasm? Oh, I was 11 when I started masturbating. Um, and I enjoyed every minute of it. Oh, yeah. Well, who doesn't? <laughs> like, who doesn't, right? But I was ashamed, too. I didn't know what was going on. Nobody taught you about what happens. I actually remember thinking I'm killing babies. And I should be saving this in case I get married and have kids. You know? Ah. I didn't know. I know. Because biblically, it is better to spill your seed in the belly of a whore than to spill your seed on the ground. Uh, and I'm Jewish, so I didn't know that was even in the yeah. Bible. <laughs> it's in. It's in. It's yeah. in the Bible. Yeah. Um, but and then and then my work around that because you know the, those those Christians, the one who go go there, and I'm like, yeah, but I don't have a seed, so I can rock and roll whatever I want. So <laughs> apparently, only guys can't masturbate. Good point. There's my. There's my work around there. Um, do you, well, tell me a funny sex story. 
All right. So <laughs> I had a client <laughs> once who um, came, she was, she came out of a uh, 25 year sexless relationship, marriage, divorced the guy, started coming to see me. I really loved this woman. She's actually since died. She had cancer. I feel so bad about it, but I really liked her. She really liked me. She'd come in every week and she'd have all these dating stories. She'd be telling me about this stuff and I would look forward to her. You know, she'd come in. I couldn't wait to hear her next sexual escapade with these different guys. She came in one time and she said, oh my God. And I met this guy and we, we, we did shrimping. I'm like, Oh, I said, did you like that? And she said, oh my God, I loved it. And she said, and she said, it was so tasty. I'm like, tasty? Shrimp? I've never heard somebody say that shrimping is tasty. And she said, well, it was. And I said, but what about the smell? And she said, well, you get used to it after you keep doing it, you get used to it. I'm like, okay. Uh, she said, but the only thing that was awkward was me, for me was using the net. And I'm like, this isn't her name, Joyce Stop. What the fuck are you talking about? She said, I went on a boat and we went shrimpy. We got in the water. We took a net. She looked at me and she goes, what the fuck are you talking about? And I said, I thought you were talking about sucking toes. Because in sex therapy world, it's ah. called shrimping. Each toe looks like a shrimp. So I love that story. And therapists crack up because usually it's the other way around. The client's trying to tell you something sexual. I'm so sexual that I sexualized shrimping. <laughs> shrimping i didn't know that there might, was a word for that and that's something a side might do or you might do with your husband tonight who knows no <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'm okay having it done to me <laughs> it's been a really long time i i yeah. did have i did have a fella who did that and uh -huh. you know i tell women that having a guy suck on your big toe is the closest that you will ever get to realizing how good a blowjob feels. I love that. That's very funny. It's because true. that's the, that's a very sensitive part of your body that never ever touches a tongue. And then it's you're just like, oh, Jesus Christ. It's yeah. pretty incredible. You might um, start something that might go into the Urban Dictionary with your name on it. Oh, that would be Female awesome. blowjobs. <laughs> exactly. Um, what's your favorite time of day to have sex? Do oh, I don't one? care. I don't have one. I, it can be any time. All right. Um, favorite position? Side. <laughs> a side. Yes. So thank you. That's my position. <laughs> and uh, do you have a favorite sex toy? No, I don't. I'm not. I, I, I'm not against them. I think they're great for people, but I don't use any. All right. But you said you talk about them in therapy. I do. I bring it up to say that you can use them. And I, and I, we talk about that. And actually we have a sex therapist in our office who um, has one on her desk. You would never know they were vibrators for women. They don't look like vibrators anymore or like dildos. They don't look right. Yeah. No, the good ones don't look like a dildo. Right. <laughs> I right. like glass ones. I like ones that look like artwork. Oh yeah. <laughs> Those are nice. And they're dishwasher safe. Yeah. Well, no, don't do that. Oh, no. no, never do that. That's horrible for the your glass sex ones. toys. Why? Well, they, they would be, but have you ever seen what happens to your glasses when you put them in and they get all those etchings? All that etching from all the abuse of the soap is places where bacteria can hide. Oh, that's so, good to know. Okay. And then also, I mean, I, if somebody washes their sex toys in the dishwasher, I don't want to eat off of their dishes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's true. <laughs> A good toy cleaner will do its job. You don't need to put it in the dishwasher. <laughs> that's so funny all right so how can people find you uh they can find me lots of ways they can go to my website joecourt.com j-o-e-k-o-r-t.com and then they can find me on instagram tiktok facebook and twitter and my handle is at dr joe court d-r-j-o-e-k-o-r-t i love that i i have seen some of your tiktoks they're pretty funny thank and, you uh, i love them did yeah, you like the one i, I said oh go ahead I don't, I don't, rem I don't remember which one I watched, but I, I think I would have a lot of trouble with the comments. Like, do you just, oh. do you have to just not look at them? Well, right now I'm going through, this is day six of horrific, horrible, nasty, bullying, bullshit comments. And because I talked somebody to somebody shared it. Well, I, I have been duetted and stitched 500 times. You can't, I am like out there with this thing. And all I say is that, did you know, <laughs> it is kind of funny. Wait, let me stop. I'm gonna, it's funny. So I say, because it's true. Did you know that straight men can have sex with men and not be gay? And then I go on. Well, that gets stitched. And so all these people, not only are they bullying me, they think I'm, I'm straight in the closet. Like I'm a closeted gay. They don't know me. 
And I say, <laughs> they don't Google me. So I can't say, every time I try to say to a comment, I'm gay, I'm gay as fuck. I'm, I've been, you know, they're like, dude, come out of the closet. It's 20, it's stupid. It's just dumb. Right. So the comments are really horrible. If you're not, if you can't handle them, then I wouldn't do it because they're brutal. Yeah, I would imagine. But, you know, I, I mean, I, that brings it back to, like, what about a guy who likes to be pegged? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, That's gay to them. You should see those comments. Right? That's gay, too. Yeah. The only thing that makes you gay is being gay. So. Oh, my God. I love that. That might be stop. a video you see me do. Right? <laughs> Please tag stand-up comedy sex ed. But that's just oh, ridiculous. Right, I will tag you. I will. Um, actually, if I if I have I I have a TikTok, but I don't think I ever use it. I think it might just be my name. But oh. um, yeah, I should I use it just to watch my my daughters do their TikToks. Maybe someday I'll do a TikTok. Who knows? Well, um, this is what I always say when men have one non-heterosexual thought, he's stigmatized. When women have one non-heterosexual thought, she's fetishized. And right. we give women wiggle room. We don't say she's a lesbian or a latent dyke. We don't say that. We say he's a latent faggot. And uh, he, it's like he has cancer all of a sudden. That's never going right. to go away. It's so stupid. I think it will. I think it will. I think it will go away. I think, I mean, there'll always be a small percentage of people that are just going to be so fully right wing that they can't let anything go. And they were probably abused as children. And a hundred percent. Or raised uh. in some, Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. there's always going to be those crazies on, on both sides. But I think that the the main core of America is starting to just really widen to what's to just waking up to the fact that this is not so much a change and it's not so much a, um, a what is it? we're not degrading America. It's always been here. We just never talked about it. And there and that's that was the problem that was the shame the shame is that we had to make people feel bad about who they were yeah right and what they talked about and that's and what, what they tried yeah. to do to me and i'm not going away i am not going away fuck them i'm here to stay yeah. unless somehow something happens to me i'm here right and i like that actually one of the reasons i like having my podcast because i get to say some stuff like that so people can hear it because they think if i'm a born-again christian republican then I must be a gay hater and, uh, you know, yeah. all of these other things. And I'm like, no, I just want to spend my money the way I want to spend my money. And, you know, I, and I don't care what kind of sex you have. I don't, yeah. I really don't. I don't want to picture you having sex, but I also don't <laughs> want to picture my parents having sex. And I don't want to picture right. my neighbors having sex. Like, I don't care who's doing who. Right. Right. No, I know. Yeah. But I am obviously curious because I'm nosy as fuck. I just asked you a bunch of nosy ass questions. I love, I, and, and if we were off camera, I would tell you more. <laughs> right. I get a lot of that. I've had people like, I would love to come on your show, but I'm not going to answer your questions. Yeah, certain things I don't answer only because my clients could hear it. But otherwise I can right. tell us, my friends all know what I'm into. I have zero shame about what I'm into. I mean, I have a little bit of shame. You can't never get, get rid of it all, right. but very, very little. Right. I love that. Okay, so people can find me on Instagram at Stand Up Comedy Sex Ed. You can also find me at Stand Up Comedy Sex Ed.com and Raylene Taskoski.com. That's my speaker website. And I set up a Facebook group just for this podcast so you can participate in polls, ask questions, politely share an alternate point of view, and generally let us know what you think of this episode and any other episodes. So you can search for Stand Up Comedy Sex Ed podcast on Facebook. Please subscribe to the podcast and share. And then also you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Raylene. So if you want to check me a couple of dollars so I can keep this thing going, I will happily take your money. Thanks for coming on the show, Joe. You were very Thanks enlightening. Thanks. I like I like comedy. I think I call myself a therapeutian, right? So I love to be a nice. comic and a therapist. And you were funny and you gave me some ideas and it's always fun to talk about sex. Always. Yeah, now you're going to steal a couple of my jokes. It's fine. I will give you credit. <laughs> I will 100% give you credit. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, if you think of anybody else that you think I should interview, please connect me. Yeah. Yeah, I will. I just, you're looking for, you, you can also go to my, uh, I have a podcast, Smart Sex, Smart Love. Go to that and see the people I've interviewed. You might find people there too. They'd be happy okay, to. Great. Yeah. 
Thank you. I, I Wait, will a, a really good website. one to talk about. Uh, a really good one. I have three of them on this, and I'm going to be in the New York Times on this topic because I uh, I understand this fetish is FinDom. Do you know about FinDom? No. So FinDom is, um, let's say you're my dom. It starts, it's actually women doing it to men, but it's morphed into other than that. But anyways, I uh, give you my bank accounts. I give you my credit card. I give you naked pictures of myself. I tell you where I live. I, I tell you my wife and children's name. Now you own me. It's BDSM without rope. And I have to, you, you, and I give you an allow, you give me an allowance of my paycheck. And it's erotic to be overpowered by you or blackmailed by you, uh, but with money. Money is the eroticism. It's a whole growing field of. All right, how do I get into that? <laughs> I know, I know. I, know I will happily that. abuse somebody's credit card. <laughs> and they will jack off to that. Let me tell you. Uh, you look you what I just bought new pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be like, ah. <laughs> Uh, you should listen to the podcast. They're really there's a woman's point of view and a man's point of view, and they're both uh, heterosexual cisgender, and it's very interesting. Excellent. I, all right, that's fantastic. All right, thanks for coming on the show. I know you yeah, have yeah. other people to talk I to do. today. Bye, Joe. All right, good talking to you.